Hello, and welcome to our holiday show. Today, we're actually going to share with you Chief Information Officers for the Center for Digital Government Home Cooking for the Holiday Show. We decided yes. that we needed something to kind of cheer us all up, get us in the holiday spirit, and moving forward. So just like all those cooking shows you see on TV, you are going to get some amazing recipes. So Phil, what do you think about our show? All I know is I am so excited. We couldn't have a better end to 2020 than to do home cooking for the holidays. <laughs> so we're going to have some fun today because CIOs are creative people. They do incredible things all day long, but they have made some incredible dishes that we're going to share with you today. Well, hi there. I am actually going to be the first one to share my recipe. Now, this is Max, and Max is all dressed up in his Christmas antlers. He thought you'd really enjoy it, just like he's enjoying it. So many of you know, I'm not much of a cook, but what I've created for you today and what I love is to give gifts and give gifts that are a little bit different, plus they're edible, so you don't have to store them and you don't have to either say, ooh, I didn't like that color. So what I've done is given you a recipe for my vanilla granola. I love making granola um, for myself because I like it a lot better than what I can buy in the stores. And plus, it gives me the chance to put it into a fun gift for my friends and family. So what you do, uh, you, my recipe is included. And these are just mason jars with kind of a fancy wooden top that I got on Amazon. Put a ribbon on it, and you've got a great gift for friends and family. So Max and I want to wish you an absolutely fun Christmas. Here's another one with a little different ribbon, a little different jar. Um, Max and I want to wish you a very fun Christmas. Got to get his antlers back up here, right? And we hope that you're really, really enjoying this video and all of the great recipes. It's now my turn to go ahead and share my recipe with you. And this recipe comes from family where over the years, we love carbs, by the way, I'm gonna say that first. We love carbs and we always wanted some sort of side dish that was easy to make that we could have around the holidays. So we have cheesy potatoes where you can have, you know, diced potatoes, cheese, onions, sour cream, butter, all the good stuff. We put it in there and when you bake it, you go ahead and look at what happens. Okay, so I got hungry and I ate some, but it's awesome. It's easy to make and it's fun for the family. So enjoy our recipe and enjoy the rest of our show. We have some incredible food for you coming up. Phil, that looks like a great recipe. That's gonna be on my Christmas dinner list. So who's next? Terry, we have an incredible recipe from Bill Kehoe from the County of Los Angeles. Enjoy this video. Thank you, Erie Public. And today I want to show off my famous holiday fruit salad. All you need to make this incredible recipe is some chopped pears, some red apples, some green apples, and some berries, and any berries will do. Now the reason this is such a great uh, post-dinner happy hour type of a uh, of a dish is that it's easy to make and you can use as much cognac as you would like depending on how the festivities are going for those awkward family uh, dinner table discussions you can go right to this and have a great time so I'm gonna start again it's chopped pears apples and berries and some cognac and some whipped cream and some lady fingers which we'll get into later on so here we go 
Okay, we're going to start by mixing in the pears. And thank you to our uh, communications manager, Sylvia, for doing all the prep work. It takes a, it takes a village for this uh, CIO office to work and also for those holiday gatherings and those dishes. Now the green apples, my favorite, by the way. More green apples. And red apples. Wow, this bowl's getting very full, so, you know, make sure you have the right size bowl for your happy hour dish. And then we have our berries. There we go. We're only going to do one of those. Okay, so now we have all of the fruit in the, uh, in the dish. Very easy to make, as you can see. So not a lot of preparation. Now, for the best part, we're going to put the whipped cream on top. Here we go. Ready? Here we go. Ta-da! See how easy that is? Now we're going to mix that in. Without spilling over the side. So if you've, if you've uh, had a few... Uh, Cognacs before this, you know, it's going to get a little messy. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that at all. So we're mixing this up. You can get the gist of that. Get that whipped cream in there with the apples and the pears and the berries. Here we go. Here we go. Look at that. Great after dinner meal. Happy hour fruit salad. Okay. That looks good. We have the uh, cake bowl, looks like a cake bowl to me, but it'll do the trick. We have some lady fingers here, and uh, we're gonna break these up and put them at the bottom. See that? Very easy, lady fingers. Here we go. And a couple more. Get the gist of it. The great thing about this holiday party or happy hour or holiday party fruit mix is that you don't have to be precise and you can put as much cognac in as necessary. All right, so we got that in, and now we're going to put in our, our preparations that we made earlier. Right on top of the lady fingers with the cognac, which I can smell already mixing in with the fruit. There we go. Not very neat, but that's okay. Woo! That's a, that's a that's a lot of cognac. Uh, <laughs> you might want to go a little less on that. <laughs> I have some meetings this afternoon, so. Uh, should be interesting. Okay, so there you go. Got the lady fingers, got the apples and the pears and the berries and the whipped cream, the cognac. Now we're going to put the caramel, Hershey's caramel on there. Put as, again, as much as you want, depending on the occasion. This is really nice. Mixes in well with everything else. Put a little on there. I happen to like this, so I'm going to put a little more in there. And now we have here, we have some almonds. Thank you. <laughs> have some almonds, almond slices. Put that right on top. Doesn't it look beautiful? Smells really nice. And then just a pinch of uh, cinnamon. There you go. And then we top it off with more whipped cream. Ready? There you go. Voila! And 
now you have your happy hour group bowl. And final touches, we'll put some strawberries around the whipped cream. Look at that. Now obviously my decorating skills are not up to par and it'll look much nicer when you do this. But there you go. All right. Thanks again, E Republic. Well, I know it looks like a Hallmark movie exploded behind me, but here in Michigan, it could get really cold outside. So we have some outdoor cooking from Mike Tim from Oakland County. Michigan. One of my favorite pastimes has been camping, especially in the winter. I spent a lot of time with the Boy Scouts and learned a lot about cooking in a Dutch oven. I'm gonna demonstrate mastacholi in a Dutch oven in a winter camping setting. When camping in the woods, we'll typically use coal right from the campfire for the Dutch oven. In this case today, I'll actually be using charcoal. One rule of thumb with a Dutch oven is to use approximately three times the inch diameter of the Dutch oven that many charcoal briquettes. So I have about 24 briquettes warming up in my charcoal chimney because I'm using an 8 inch Dutch oven. The first time I did this camping I actually used lasagna noodles but now for simplicity's sake I typically use a small penne noodle but you can see very typical ingredients for a lasagna type of casserole. In this case, I'm using pre-cooked turkey meat, but I often use a bulk Italian sausage that I brown before I take camping. The assembly process is pretty straightforward. Start with the diced tomatoes on the bottom. That liquid needs to be what cooks the noodles. And just as a point of interest, the noodles are raw. They will be cooked by the moisture from the tomatoes and the sauce. So I then layer the noodles, and you can see now the ricotta cheese has been spread. Then layer in the meat, and of course the sauce. And make sure you save room for the mozzarella. Sprinkle on the mozzarella, and then close it up. Now you can see the charcoal is about ready and I will put about two-thirds or 12 briquettes approximately on the top of the Dutch oven and about one-third of the briquettes underneath the Dutch oven. Now in the winter time you may need a little bit more charcoal, a little bit more heat, but generally in about 45 minutes to an hour this will be ready to go. So here we are, 50 minutes in, and you can see the steam coming out of the Dutch oven. And boy, does it smell good. As I pull it back, you can also see it's boiling in there. Let's give it a taste. And now, sitting around the campfire with my hot mastacholi, my favorite glass of Chianti. Buon appetito. Now we have Calvin Rhodes, the CIO for the state of Georgia with a fantastic recipe demonstration. Calvin, take it away. Love to spend some time in the kitchen doing different things. Thought today it might be a little fun to do something around sous vide. And so to give you a little insight into the slow water bath cooking and uh, maybe share a few thoughts around why you'd want to do that. If you want something tender and juicy uh, when cooking meat, uh, sous vide is a good choice. I'll share a few thoughts with you. We're gonna do a few things here. We're gonna uh, sous vide a steak. We're gonna finish it off in the pan. I like to put a dry rub on my uh, steak, so that's what we're going to, uh, to start out, uh, getting that ready and doing that. All right, the first thing we're gonna do is uh, just start out with some salt and pepper. I want a uh, good tablespoon of salt and I'm using 
kosher salt. We want a half a tablespoon of pepper, a tablespoon of ground cloves. I'm doing a half a tablespoon of uh, curry powder, actually a little bit more than a half. And then I got this ginger extract that I'll do a half a tablespoon of it. So uh, that's what I've added to my rub. All right, I've got my steaks. And we're just gonna dry those off real quick. And then we're just gonna liberally apply. And what I bought was some filet mignon. A nice tender cut of meat. The rub's gonna give it a little bit more flavor. So that's all the prep there we're going to do. Now I'm going to move over and we're going to uh, actually put this in a vacuum seal bag before we sous vide it. And all we're doing is removing uh, the air from the bag. All right, I've got my two fillets and here's my hot water bath. Uh, this is the sous vide unit. And um, all this is is a heater. It's got your setting for your temperature and then a temperature to water. So I started this um, you know, 15 minutes ago to give it time to get up the temperature. This product uh, today runs somewhere between $100 and $125. And then the container that's a separate item, uh, I bought, I think it was $25. Uh, you might ask, uh, why sous vide? I mentioned earlier the juiciness, the tenderness, uh, but also uh, the cook time is a great reason to use sous vide. Search online for sous vide and whatever you want to prepare and you'll find just hundreds and hundreds of, of recipes. So with the sous vide, uh, I'm cooking it a, between medium rare and medium. But when you're having a party, uh, the note, okay, I need to cook this for an hour. I can tend typically cook a steak as long as four hours and not start breaking in it down more, the meat down more than I would want it, want it to. I still want it to chew like a steak. And so that flexibility in time is uh, probably the third reason I enjoy sous vide cooking. All right, we've been cooking for hour and 20 minutes. Um, you know, remember, we needed to cook at least an hour and can cook up to four hours. At medium rare, I think it's a little bit better if you keep the range between an hour and two and a half hours. Um, but again, there's so much flexibility here. Uh, we're, we've, we've cooked it at 130 degrees. Uh, that should give us a nice medium rare uh, steak. Uh, one of the things I will tell you, if you try this, uh, your color of the meat is always a little redder than uh, you're used to. Uh, but if you look at any, uh, you know, if it was uh, medium, you're looking at it, it's a little red, but there's no blood. I mean, it is thoroughly cooked. And that's one of the reasons we're going to sear it on the stove. Uh, so it has more of that look that we're used to because, you know, a lot of food, uh, gourmet food is, you know, does it, does it look good? And so uh, we're used to food looking a certain way. And then also I think the searing does add a few more flavors uh, to the meat and uh, and, and literally, we're going to sear it probably 45 seconds on each side on a very hot pan. So uh, we're, we're done. So I'm going to stop the sous vide and take the top off of my container. Uh, the top is just here to help keep the heat in. Um, that keeps the, the actual unit here from having to work really hard to keep the temperature at a certain level. For steak, uh, that temperature is... Uh, it's pretty easy for it to maintain, uh, which as I say is 130 degrees. I'm cooking steak, I'm cooking chicken, I'm cooking uh, turkey breast. A lot of times, you know, we'd shy away from just buying a turkey breast because it can, can be uh, a little dry. But a turkey breast in a sous vide, I mean, you're slicing it and clear juices are just running, uh, overflowing into the, to the dish. And, uh, it is just a fabulous, uh, healthy meal. Is we're gonna finish this steak off in a pan and the only thing we're doing is basting it with butter. So let me grab some butter. And the first thing I'm gonna do is just 
drop this right into the pan. At the same time I do that, I put the butter in. I use a whole stick of butter because it's just easy to baste. Uh, you can certainly use probably half that amount. And I'm not going to baste till I flip it. All right, we're going to flip this over. Grab a spoon. All right, nice big spoon. And just start basting it. I think that just adds a little bit more flavor for it. And this is looking nice. Now, there is a problem with this approach to a cooking steak. And the problem is, just like my wife, that I have really destroyed her ability to go to a restaurant and order steak. This, honestly, will be one of the best dishes you can make. And when you go out to a restaurant, it's just really difficult to find somebody uh, who can do it better. And then my toasted pine nuts, and I did add a little kosher salt directly to them because it'll just make all the difference. I wait till right before I serve those uh, to keep before I plate them. That's really nice. And then the last finishing touch, it makes all the difference. And this is our mushroom uh, port reduction sauce. And we really reduce that sauce. The, the port in that. Uh, like I said, I did add a little bit of red wine. Uh, the fact that you can cut this uh, almost with a fork and just uh, how tender it's going to be, uh, it's just a wonderful uh, way to cook and to learn some new things. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, happy holidays, everyone. Ever how you celebrate this time of year, I hope you and your families have a safe and enjoyable one. Uh, so Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, and best wishes to all of you ever how you celebrate this time of year. The next recipe on our list is from Sharon Horn, who's from the state of Maine. And Sharon actually has her own restaurant that she runs in the summer. So you might want to check out this recipe. And if you get to Maine, you actually might want to check out her restaurant. I'm really excited to share with you one of my go-to appetizer recipes, especially around the holiday season. And I'd like to introduce you to the star of our show. So I'm going to be making a quick and easy lobster dip. So here's Mr. Lobster. As you can see, he's getting ready to have his hot bath. So before you put them in the pot of water, most people might not realize that you don't take these rubber bands off. See, he's still a little feisty. So that's what's gonna protect you from these really massive claws as we get them ready. For those of you who don't have lobster readily available, you can always order it online from one of our many retailers that ship it overnight to you. Or we also have a lobster in a can. And so personally, I've never tried it, but it's very similar to um, crab meat in a can, salmon in a can. So you can certainly try that. And that way you'll always have it on hand because once you see how easy this appetizer is and how good it is, you're gonna wanna make sure that you have all of the staples to pull it out, especially Especially when you have um, unannounced guests stop by. All right, so here we are. We're getting ready to cook. Mr. Lobster, here he is. So we cook him with the rubber bands on because those claws are still pretty powerful. So he's going to go in head first into about just two inches of water. Hi, girls. Water. <laughs> That's my dogs in the background. Two inches of water for about seven minutes, and I'll show you a trick once he's done. Okay, it's been seven minutes. We're gonna check Mr. Lobster. Ooh, he looks good. Oh, he lost a claw in the cooking. I'm gonna flip him around the right side. 
and then you just take his antenna and give it a quick little pull and if it comes off you know it's done so i'm going to grab his claw shut all this off and then i'll meet you inside and there he is all right we're going to show you real quick how to clean a lobster so you can take the rubber bands off and this is how you do the claw and so you Break this piece off, pull it out. Usually the piece of meat um, comes out with it. Sometimes it will stay in there. It looks like it stayed in there on this one, so we'll get it. Break this at the knuckle. These are soft shells, so you can just break them with your, your hands here. Sometimes it comes out easy, sometimes it doesn't. And there's a nice piece of claw meat. I'm gonna go in for the knuckle next. So you break it and then you can just push the knuckle meat out with your finger and some more knuckle. All right, now for the body and the tail. So we'll first start with the tail. So you break the tail off and then you just push the rest of the tail through. and then you pull back this section right here. And there you have it, you have a nice tail piece. And then these are um, one and a quarter pound lobsters, so there probably won't be anything in between the rib meat, but if there, there is, you take the shell off, you break it open and between the rib meat, the ribs, there's some meat and it's really sweet meat. So again, these are a little small. So, um, and then the way my mother and my grandmother taught me for the legs, you can clean them, but the best thing to do is, so here's your leg. So you just break it um, at the top here and then you just kind of suck on the legs and the meat will come out. Um, as you suck on them. So see, as I'm just kind of pushing on this with my finger, there's a little bit of meat that comes out. So, so there you have it. That is one lobster. Hey, all right. So we're gonna make this really quick and easy lobster dip. So these are things that I have in my pantry at all times. Um, they're just staples, so cream cheese, marinated artichokes, and Parmesan cheese. So I'm just doing a small batch. I'm gonna do um, a four ounces of cream cheese into a microwavable bowl. And then you're going to, oops, not destroy everything. And then you're gonna put a few of the marinated artichokes um, in with it. Um, this is completely up to you. I usually do, these are quartered. So I'm probably doing about eight of them. And then you're gonna put a just a little bit of the Parmesan cheese right on the top. All right, so all we've done is we've microwaved that for just about a minute. So you just want the cream cheese to get soft. You notice, that, you notice we haven't put the lobster in yet. Um, that's because the lobster's already cooked, so we don't wanna cook it um, any, any more than it is. Okay. So now we're gonna put some lobster in. My handy dandy assistant. So I'm just gonna cut the lobster tail into big chunks. Because again, you want it to you want that you want nice big chunks. So we put the dip back in the microwave for another 30 seconds after we added the lobster meat and the rest of the cheese in. And so here we have it. We have it with a little baguette, some carrots, some crackers, some green beans, whatever you may have. And then we sprinkled a little bit of tarragon on the top, only because I didn't have any chives. Oh, back up there. And there you are, bon appetit.
I hope you enjoyed my recipe. If you don't have lobster, you can substitute crab meat, or you can substitute smoked salmon, or just put some spinach in there and make a great spinach and artichoke dip. Happy holidays from the state of Maine. Stephanie Dedman, the CIO from Tennessee is here to share with us a story from her family about this great candy uh, that she's created for our holiday cooking show. And welcome to my kitchen. The recipe I would like to share with you today is called potato candy. And this is the finished product. I'll have to describe that um, the consistency did not quite turn out exactly right, uh, but that's okay because it still tastes great. I was actually born in Kentucky. Both my parents are from Kentucky. Um, and I tend to think that potato candy is a Southern recipe, uh, but at my family uh, Christmases and, and holiday gatherings, there was always potato candy. Um, it's very easy to make. Uh, and while it may sound um, uh, maybe not so delicious, I can tell you, you don't really taste the potato. Um, so there's three ingredients. Um, one, a potato, uh, two, confectioner sugar, and three, peanut butter. And so the way that it's a very simple recipe, uh, you basically boil a small baking potato until it's ready to be mashed. Um, you then add in, uh, at least starting, about four cups of confectioner sugar. Uh, blend that very well until it begins to make a paste. At this point, you'll have to sort of um, gauge the consistency and you probably wanna have at least two or three boxes of confectioner sugar on hand to try to get to the right consistency. Uh, but when it's thick enough um, to, to be paste-like and fairly um, uh, stiff, you spread the paste uh, and then spread it with peanut butter. At this point, it helps to put it in the refrigerator for a couple of hours and let it get cold and um, sticky, consistent. Um, and then um, when ready, you basically just roll up the paste and slice the candy uh, like you would a jelly roll. And if these had turned out better, they would be prettier, um, but this is potato candy. I hope you enjoy, and I hope you all have a happy holiday season. Thank you. Our next recipe is some real home cooking from Peter Wallace from the city of Virginia Beach. <laughs> Thank you for entering my home. Allow me to show you my family recipe. This is the finished product. It's what it looked like. And what I'm gonna do is ask my son to give me the verdict of a thumbs up or a thumbs down. What do you say, son? Good to go. Well, I got the clearance. A CIO job is never done. Thank you, have a great day. Our next recipe is all the way from over on the West Coast. Linda Garrell, some real home cooking. So today I'd like to share with you some hot appetizers. I love hot appetizers because they just make the house smell wonderful. And these are going to be easy and fun, something you can do with your family and friends. They can help you um, prepare these. And I will also add some tech because what's cooking without some new gadgets and tech? So stay with me for just a few minutes and learn some fun new tricks. So the first recipe that I'd like to share with you is chicken wings. Now I adore chicken wings. And the tech that we'll be using is my new air fryer. So I love my Ninja air fryer and it is so fast and so simple and it cooks everything lightning speed. And you just put it in this basket, is what I'm gonna do with my chicken wings, and they'll be done in 20 minutes. So now I'm working on dinner for tonight, so it's, it's that quick. So the recipe that I'm sharing with you is chicken wings that are um, salt and vinegar. I love these. If you don't like salt and vinegar, you can always um, cook chicken wings and toss them with barbecue sauce or teriyaki sauce. Um, hot sauce, whatever you like. So I've been soaking these chicken wings uh, for um, about two hours. Um, I even cook frozen chicken wings. So I'm gonna stop for just a second, cook these up real quick, and then you'll see how they turn out. So the chicken wings are done, 
And one thing I forgot to tell you is when you're using your air fryer and cooking chicken wings, about halfway through the time, like after about 10 minutes, flip them over so that um, they brown on both sides and um, it only takes about 20 minutes, 17 to 20 minutes. So they're done, here they are. Um, I put salt and pepper on them and of course I love everything spicy so I had to put chili flakes on them because I love spicy food. So they're all done and they're ready to go so I'm going to set those aside and we're going to go on to appetizer number two. So moving on to appetizer number two, this appetizer is going to be wontons. These are one of my favorite things and they're fun for everyone to make. So you start with wonton wrap wrappers, these little paper thin pieces of dough and you find these in the vegetable section of your grocery store and you can fill them with anything, pork, chicken, um, I'm going to be using salmon and so um, and then you fold them up and then you put them in the air fryer for about six minutes and you save about 10 or 15 minutes. So I'm going to show you with, uh, I'm going to lower the camera and hopefully this works. Okay, um, how to wrap a wonton. So I'm, the filling I'm using is salmon and cream cheese because everything is better with cream cheese. Um, chicken and a cream cheese with jalapeno peppers in it because I like everything spicy. So what you do is you um, put your wontons out and you put your filling in them. And now my hands are clean. You take a little bit of water on your finger and go along the edges of the wonton like this. Then you pull opposite corners up and then you press the little seams together. If you can see that, you just press the little seams together and pop it in the air fryer and they come out perfect. Now the recipe that I shared with you um, is one from Martha Stewart. So of course, you know, that's going to be wonderful. Um, but I kind of use whatever is actually in my refrigerator at the time. So uh, these are so simple and again, fun to make and something that um, you can quickly do if you have company that comes in unexpected. So I'm going to finish doing these, pop them in the air fryer and I'll show you how they turn out. So now that we've made appetizers, we need to make something to drink to go with them. So these drinks could be alcoholic or non-alcoholic and you have to have new tech to make drinks. So my new tech is this perfect drink scale that comes with um, a shaker and also comes with an app. And the app, as you can see in the screen, um, has all these different drinks in it. And then when you click on a drink, it tells you exactly what's in it. And the scale will actually help make sure that you're measuring things correctly. So you can't make a mistake and they turn out beautiful every time. So we're gonna make two drinks. One is called Cranberry 75 and the other is Bee's Knees. And you'll notice the beautiful color of both of these. And it's because my favorite thing, Empress Gin, which is um, purple, um, comes from Canada. If you've ever been to the Empress Hotel, it is um, associated with the Empress Hotel. And uh, it makes beautiful, beautiful, it has botanicals in it, so it makes a beautiful um, smooth drink. So I'm gonna make these real quick and um, then show you how they turn out. So we're at the end of our appetizer and drink special with in Linda Jarrell's kitchen and our wontons turned out perfect. Our chicken wings, yes, there were more of them when we started, but I, I've eaten just a couple. Our bee's knees drink turned out just yummy and our cranberry um, 75 drink turned out great. It's got sparkling wine in there so it will fizz up and that's kind of cool. Um, love the tech gadgets. We have a merry and bright napkin and um, matching um, plates. So we're ready for our party and thank you eRepublic for um, inviting me to join you as we talk about holiday spirit. And I certainly hope everyone has a very safe and happy holiday. And I wish you all the very, very best in the new year. Coming to you from the state of Massachusetts, Kurt Wood has an outstanding recipe for a holiday seafood special. 
I know you're not only going to enjoy the recipe, but you're going to love watching Kurt actually put it all together. Here's the soup. It's a beautiful soup. Nice red tomato based soup. You get the nice mussels, you got the shrimp, calamari, or squid as we like to call it here in Boston. You can see the nice little neck clams and the mussels. This is just a wonderful. Uh, some people might refer to this as a chipino, but it's uh, it's kind of my version of a chipino. My wife and I came up with this uh, kind of one night just playing around when we had a snowstorm here in Boston. And we just started putting all this good stuff together and came up with a really great, great dish. Very hearty for you. And by the way, this will last you about four or five meals. Uh, when you don't want fettuccine, you can use nice white rice or brown rice uh, to complement. So thank you very much and enjoy. Anyway, so we were able to just combine all the soup products here today, and we have the nice fettuccine, and you see the nice fresh bowls. Uh, if you kind of zoom in on the bowls here, and what we're going to do, we have nice tomato base, we have scallops, we have shrimp, we have calamari, we have Atlantic cod, we have little neck clams and mussels, uh, and uh, just put together, and to complement this, we're going to put a little, little fresh fettuccine, I have a little fresh uh, Parmesan cheese, uh, just to complement the taste. And I will tell you, this will stick to your ribs, and I, like I said before, this, this meal will last you uh, three or four extra meals, uh, and when you run out of fettuccine, uh, if you run out of fettuccine before you run out of soup, you just use brown rice if you have it in the refrigerator. Enjoy. Arizona's in the house. Maricopa County, Ed Winfield has some great home cooking for you. Okay, welcome to Ed's Kitchen. I started making pumpkin pies about 25 years ago when I told my mother-in-law, I said, Mom, I don't like your pumpkin pies. And in fact, I've never liked your pumpkin pies. And so she said, okay, smarty pants, you start making the pumpkin pies. So I started making them. I collected a lot of recipes over the years. Everyone seems to like the pumpkin pies. So tonight we're gonna make grandma's pumpkin pie. Now, the interesting thing about this is that you make it on the stove top. You don't cook it in the oven. And I'll show you how to do all that. Uh, the other thing about this recipe is that it takes a lot of time. Now, you remember back in the day, Grandma, you know, she had a lot of time on her hands and she could be making these pies. But what else are you going to be doing now? It's a pandemic. You're sitting at home. You should have plenty of time to work on this pie. So put down the government technology seminars, stop watching those, and take a little time and make grandma's pumpkin pie. It's gonna be the greatest pie you've ever had. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, are you forgetting something? What? If you're gonna make grandma's pumpkin pie, you should this? be wearing grandma's apron. Are you saying I gotta wear an apron to make this pie? Oh, absolutely. All right, there it is. I guess it'll taste a lot better if we're wearing the bib. All right, thank you. Let's get started. Okay, so what I'd like to do is just explain a few things and some of the ingredients and some of the equipment you're gonna to need to, uh, to make grandma's pumpkin pie. Okay, first of all, you're gonna need a pie dish. Um, we're gonna pre-bake the pie shell and uh, we'll talk about that. You need a, uh, some type of device to separate the egg yolk from the egg whites. A very important part of the recipe. We're gonna talk about that. You're gonna need something called a double boiler. A double boiler is where you put water in the bottom pan, it creates steam, and then you cook whatever you're cooking in the top pan. It's a little system like this, uh, so that the, the, uh, uh, the pie cooks with the steam and it's not cooking directly on the heat. Now, if you don't have this fancy little setup here, you can just use a regular pan on top of one another and create a little bit of a, uh, a double pan. So that's how that works. Uh, you need a mixer, um, and you need the various ingredients that are in the recipe. Uh, importantly, you've got to have your dry sherry wine, and uh, obviously your pumpkin, and the other ingredients. So there it is. Here we go. Okay, now I'm going to show you how to separate the egg white from the egg yolk. You take your funnel, uh, you crack your egg, you drop it in the funnel here and you start to work it a little bit and eventually the egg white will pull away from the egg yolk and you'll just be left with the egg white in the bowl and the egg yolk in the funnel and you'll set aside the egg yolk you're going to use that later when we make 
the actual pie filling on the uh, on the stovetop. So you can help it along a little bit here if you need to. Now the one thing that's important is that you cannot get any yolk in the egg whites. They have to be a clean separation. So just be careful and make sure that the egg whites come out completely and the egg yolk comes out completely. There you go. Okay, I'm gonna make the gelatin. I take the cold water and I put it in the bowl and then I add the gelatin to it. It's just a mixture. And then you uh, stir that up and let it sit. It'll harden up and it'll be like uh, uh, a gelatin. I'll show you that. Okay, here's my eggs separated. The egg whites in the bowl and the egg yolks there on the saucer. Uh, we save those egg yolks for later when we're making the pumpkin. Uh, but the, um, the egg whites we now can put into our mixer. Pour that in there like that. And we can start to fluff those. So you have to fluff these for quite a while until they get real white and fluffy. And so we'll start it and I'll show you what that looks like. Okay, so if you've done the egg whites correctly, I've been uh, mixing these now probably for five minutes. Uh, they should all be nice and fluffy and white and, uh, and really fluffed up nicely. So I'm gonna add the gelatin into that bowl and then I'm gonna turn this back on and mix in that gelatin and we'll have our egg whites in good shape. Okay, so I've mixed all the ingredients in the recipe into the, um, into the top of the double boiler. And um, for those of you who note that there, there's light uh, sherry wine in there, that all gets burned off in the, in the cooking process. So you don't need to worry about all of that. But there's the bottom of the double boiler is boiling. I'm gonna set this on here now. And what you have to do now is you have to stir all this up continuously for 15 minutes. You can't let this burn and you can't um, let it get too hot. So I'm gonna go ahead and stir this for 15 minutes. I'll give you a couple action shots along the way, but you're basically cooking the pie filling now on top of the stove rather than a normal pie, you cook it in the oven. So that's what's happening with this double boiler and the pie filling. Okay, I'm continuing to stir the pie filling. I'm probably about five minutes in right now. Uh, keep going for 15 minutes. 15 minutes goes by quick. That's just like a quarter hour of one of the government technology webinars. So just keep stirring and keep it going. All right. Okay, I've been stirring this now for about 15 minutes. Um, you can see it's getting nice and hot. The steam's coming off of there. So this is cooked up real nicely and we'll be done now with that portion of it. So I'm gonna turn this off and go back to the uh, egg whites. Okay, now back to the egg whites. You can see they're nice and fluffy. I'm gonna pour in the sugar and I'm gonna start this up and we'll get those uh, whip up again. And we'll be ready to add everything together and put it into the pie shell. Okay, the egg whites are all fluffed up with the, uh, I added the sugar. Now I'm gonna put the pumpkin mixture into this bowl as well. And I'm going to stir it all together uh, into the final mixture. So I'm gonna do that. I'll show you what that looks like when that's all mixed together. There's our final mixture all together. And I'm now going to take it out of the mixer and I'm going to pour it into the pie shell, the pre-cooked pie shell. Pour the mixture in. You wanna be a little careful because this bowl is hot now. So I'm just gonna get it started here and then I'm going to, uh, to uh, go ahead and get a spatula and get all of that out of there. So that's uh, adding it to the pre-cooked pie shell. Okay, and there it is, the finished product. Grandma's pumpkin pie. Now you have to let this chill overnight or chill for a few hours. It'll stiffen up. The, um, the addition of the egg whites and all of that makes it very, very fluffy. So uh, you'll be really surprised when you eat it, how fluffy it is and how it just melts in your mouth. So I'm gonna actually put this in the refrigerator overnight and tomorrow we're gonna have ourselves a great piece of pumpkin pie. And here is the finished pie ready for the final taste test. 
And now for the final test. Mmm. Now that's a good pie. Grandma would really be proud. Terry, we got some great recipes from CIOs across the country. We got some pictures and we had some fun home cooking. We even got some from Brian Sestokas from the Los Angeles Metro. Wow, that's great, Bill. Well, you know, going a little bit to the south, we've got a recipe from Eric Romero from the city of Baton Rouge. That's interesting because back to California, we got one from Rob Lloyd from the city of San Jose. Great stuff. Well, thanks so much for being with us for this terrific home cooking for the holiday show. We hope that you've enjoyed it as much as we did in putting it together. Thanks so much to all the CIOs for agreeing to be a part of this crazy idea. We were so excited about the participation. Now, remember you can go out and get all of these recipes at govtech.com slash holiday recipes. So before we close, I just wanna say thank you to everybody for being a part of making it through 2020. You've just done a stellar job of supporting each other and supporting the citizens of your communities. So again, from me and from Max, have a great holiday. So Phil, over to you. Have you been good this Happy year? holidays, everyone. <laughs>